London news agents. Is someone who has amplified the voices of extreme, indeed far-right, content and conspiracy theories a fit and proper person to own one of our biggest and most influential newspapers? That is at the heart of what we're going to be talking about on the show today with a news agent's exclusive story. This concerns Sir Paul Marshall, a businessman of whom you may not have heard, but as a Conservative donor, Brexit backer, part owner of GB News, is already one of the most influential voices at the heart of centre-right politics in Britain today. He wants to buy The Telegraph and Spectator. On top of that, the most influential Conservative publications in Britain today. So he might be about to become more powerful still, as powerful a media tycoon as even Rupert Murdoch. And we can reveal, through an exclusive news agent's Hope Not Hate partnership, that over the last few months, Sir Paul has been, through a private account, retweeting and liking content which is on the most extreme end of political opinion, about Islam, expulsion of migrants, about homosexuality. Will this disqualify him from the ownership of the Telegraph? Should it? And what does it say about the radicalisation of opinion and politics in Britain today. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And just to say that later in the show, we're going to be talking about, obviously, the events that unfolded in the Commons last night, the reverberations from that, which seem to be all centred around a speaker who was worried about extremism and the threat that it posed to MPs, not a million miles away uh, from the topic that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about right now. But we're going to start with our own exclusive reporting with Hope Not Hate, the group that is working with us on a story which we think will be of interest to many people who are trying to understand where the centre of gravity of the Conservative Party is now and what kind of politics some of the big money is pushing us towards. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the man at the centre of our story. His name is Paul Marshall. He is one half, actually one third of Marshall Waste. It's a big hedge fund. It manages assets of around 60, 62 billion dollars. He himself has somewhere in the region, we think of around 600 million pounds. And he's a big Tory donor. In 2019, he gave 500,000 pounds to the Conservative Party. He co-finances GB News. It's the fastest growing TV channel in Britain. And we understand he is now one of the bidders for The Telegraph and The Spectator being advised on that now and has said if he doesn't make that bid work, he's got alternative plans for a rival publication. So what you're talking about is someone who in a very short space of time could be almost a a Rupert Murdoch-like figure in terms of his ownership of the media. Because GB News is growing and growing fast and he owns 41.2% of that through the holding company All Perspectives Limited. He also owns Unheard, which is a, a website which is a voice apparently for all sorts of views. Heterodox is a word they use very often. But it's got a very conservative underpinning to it in the key people uh, that run it. And of course, as you just said, Emily, he wants to take over the Daily Telegraph group, the Daily and Sunday Telegraph and the Spectator. And that would mean he would have GB News, Unheard, the Telegraph, the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator. And before we take you to the tweets to what he's actually been saying, liking, retweeting. We should just perhaps explain his politics. Um, He's a Brexiteer. He gave a lot to the Brexit cause and he's a liberal. And I think we need to take that small L in the very original sense of the word. Exactly. He thinks of liberal ideas, liberal thinking. He is not particularly a conservative and he's certainly not a progressive. And he has been on quite a journey. He was, I think, originally a researcher for Charles Kennedy in 1985. He became the Lib Dem leader. He thought his home was originally with the Lib Dems. He stood as an SDP candidate in Fulham. He lost. And he worked with David Laws, another Lib Dem, to write the Orange Book. It's all about reclaiming liberalism. It was a free market tract. They fell out, essentially, when he realised that Lib Dems meant progressive. And he thought of it in a sort of more Brexity sense as being radical, liberating, with, as you say, a small L to liberal, which means free markets as much as anything else. Yeah. And um, as Emily was saying at the top, we've been working with Hope Not Hate, who are an anti-extremism organisation and uh, they a little while ago brought a story to our attention which as I say we've been working on with them on and this relates to Sir Paul Marshall's 
Twitter account. Now, he had a Twitter account which, before September 2023, was public. Anyone could see it was clearly his. It was clearly his, and uh, he used it like many people do. He had 5,000 followers, including many senior journalists, conservative ministers in particular, MPs and so on. Now, in September 2023, around the time that Marshall's name started to be touted as a potential buyer for The Telegraph and Spectator, he set his Twitter account to protected mode. So that meant that only people who follow his account could view his activity and he could choose whether to accept new followers. He then removed any identifying information from the profile and changed the username to Aeropagus123, which, consistently enough, matches a company set up by Marshall in 2021, Aeropagus Ventures. I'm just going to come in at that point because I think it's quite relevant. Aeropagus is a classical reference. Sorry, I've on... mispronounced no, it. No, like no, the, no. Like, I should like tell you the, the only like reason. The, the, no, uh, I'm mentioning it only because Areopagus is is taken on by the poet John Milton, which is all about freedom of the press. It's essentially a byword for being able to say what you think, which I think is not incidental to what he's now writing. It is so. So Areopagus, our very own classicist, Emily Maitlis, uh, corrected me rightly. He s- resets it to that in September 2023. Now, after that point. It has came to Hope Not Hate's attention and then our attention that some of the material that Marshall, in this private form of his Twitter account, started to like and retweet was of an was of an extremist nature. Again, he's not tweeting it himself, just to be absolutely clear, but he is liking and retweeting accounts which are on the extreme end of politics and indeed sometimes the f- extreme far right of politics in particular. So just to give you a sense of some of the things that he has liked and retweeted. Among the tweets in recent months includes a tweet which declared that it is only a matter of time, quote, before a civil war starts in Europe. The native European population is losing patience with fake refugee invaders. In January 2024, he liked another tweet which said, if we want European civilization to survive, we need to not just close the borders, but start mass expulsions immediately. We don't stand a chance unless we start this process very soon. This is a theme, this idea of there being civil war in Europe prompted by Islamic immigration or Muslim immigration is a theme that he is quite regularly liking or retweeting tweets about. So another one which came a little bit later from another account which is tweeting this sort of stuff. Civil war is coming. There has never been a country that has remained peaceful with a sizable Islamic presence. Why do our leaders believe Britain would be an exception to that rule? Once the Muslims get to 15 to 20 percent of the population, the current cold civil war will turn hot. Another tweet which described Mohammed as one of the worst men who have ever who has ever lived. Now, this isn't these aren't tweets that are saying we've got too much immigration. These aren't tweets that are saying, you know, we need to have a better debate about immigration or we need to have a reasonable debate about immigration. They're tweets which are positing basically a well-known extreme far-right conspiracy theorist, which is to say that Muslims are trying to come to Europe to take over Europe and then install basically an Islamic theocracy. There is another tweet which he likes, which literally sets out the four stages of Islamic infiltration into Europe, which ends in an Islamic theocracy. You might know it as the great replacement theory. I mean, just to put this in terms, he is not alone. It's not, you know, his theory. It's not even the person who's tweeted it, his theory. It's a much bigger, if you like, conspiracy theory, which is that immigration is about trying to replace a white, Christian, European identity with an invader. And that's why the language is about civil war. That's why the language is about invasion. That's why the language is about expulsion. It kind of takes you back to something in the, you know, seventh century, which is this idea of the Muslims are coming and we need to kick them out. Well, it's also a certain amount of Aryan philosophy. And it is exactly what we saw in America from the extreme right there. The Great Replacement Theory, when I was based in DC, that was kind of at the fringes, at the edges of the people who were supporting Donald Trump and who played a role. This is a Bannon theory. Yeah, and who played a role in January the 6th, a big role in January the 6th. The Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, all these sort of groups, and QAnon as well, pushing this argument about the fact that kind of Western civilization was losing its identity and that had to be mass expulsion of Muslims to achieve a kind of normalisation of your country. Well, indeed, the uh, account that he retweeted, which set out that the four stages of the kind of Islamic conquest of, of Europe, 
is an account which is Amy Mech, who is a high, very pro-Trump, anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic campaigner account. So you can see that there is often a fusion between these two, these different strands of kind of radical right, sometimes far right, mm. conservative thought on both sides of the Atlantic. And it isn't just about Muslims or Islam that some of the more extreme content that was either liked or retweeted by Sir Paul Marshall either. Some of it is about things like LGBTQ+, plus, for example. So uh, In Orban's Hungary. In Orban's Hungary. the right idea. And Again, elsewhere. So even who believes in the white European. Well, indeed so. And even just this week, so on February the 18th, Sir Paul retweeted a far-right YouTuber, a guy called Carl Benjamin, who retweeted a meme which said this, Pascal's wager in the 21st century, he said, God may or may not be real, but the other side is so passionate, so committed to worshipping Satan, evil, homosexuality, and corrupting children. Note the casual elision there between you homosexuality people, and, and children, corrupting yeah. children, that even if God wasn't real, believing in him to fend these demons off is preferable. Another account that he liked on January the 19th was an account praising Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, saying there is not enough money in the world to force us to accept mass migration to put our children in the hands of LGBTQ activists. So there is the a spectrum of radical right opinion. And the point is, is that whatever Sir Paul's private views, he has amplified these voices, these extremist voices and extremist content. And that includes things like climate change, scepticism and lots of other sort of general anti-culture war, anti-woke stuff as well. So homophobic, Islamophobic... Is any of this illegal? Well, it doesn't... It, no, there's no suggestion that anything here is illegal, although, there, of course, there are uh, there are laws on, on hate crime and so on, but there, aren't, there isn't a suggestion that this is illegal. I think what there is, we should say at this point, of course, that you would expect we approached Sir Paul and asked him about this, and, of course, we did so. It is worth noting that we did so earlier this week, and we did notice that pretty much as soon as we had done so, or within the next 24 hours or so, some of these tweets started to mysteriously disappear from Sir Paul Marshall's anonymized account, um, i.e. the retweets and the likes, one by one, disappeared, started deleted. to vanish. Deleted, disappeared from the account. This is what he said, the statement that he got back to us with, or his representatives got back to us with. Paul Marshall's account is private, but is nonetheless followed by 5,000 people, including many journalists. He posts on a wide variety of subjects, and those cited represent a small and unrepresentative sample of over 5,000 posts. This sample does not represent his views. As most ex-Twitter users know, it can be a fountain of ideas, but some of it is of uncertain quality, and all his posts have now been deleted to avoid any further misunderstanding. OK, so that's the statement uh, from Paul Marshall. When he says, or his spokesman says, that's a tiny proportion, since his account became anonymised, is it a tiny proportion? So I hope not. We asked, I hope not, I hate to have a look into this. They said that since his account became anonymised, the number of tweets that you might regard as in some way being extreme or containing some version of extreme content that would come across their radar ordinarily is higher than that. So it's around a quarter. So of the 150 tweets or so, they say that around 40 or so of those tweets would raise alarm bells for them in terms of it being on the radical side or extremist side of content that they would see. Either way, I think you can look at it this way. I mean, whatever you think about the content, whatever you think about what Sir Paul has said, we obviously can't know what his motivations were. We're not speculating about that. But it is true to say that even if you amplify the voices of extreme content or far-right content, only a few times, that has to raise some questions about your own judgment, and particularly at a time when you are trying to buy one of the biggest newspaper groups in the country. So as I say, we've been working with Hope Not Hate on this investigation, and I've spoken to Joe Mulhall. He's the director of research for Hope Not Hate, and I wanted to just get a sense from him as to why he thinks it's important that we are alive to the fact that this content appears to be becoming, certainly on the right of politics, more mainstream. Joe, thanks so much for coming on. Just give us a sense of why this story sort of piqued your interest and what it was about Sir Paul in particular that generated your interest at the time when you started looking into this. It kind of came from our interest in GB News originally. You know, we've obviously been spending a lot of time monitoring GB News in the, in the last couple of years and its impact on kind of conservative politics, mm. radical right politics. And Paul Marshall obviously is one of those figures that pops up as a co-owner, but he's also involved in a kind of wider scene with Unheard. 
and a number of things that are well. Just read. explain to people what unheard is because they might not be familiar. Yeah, with it. it's it's a kind of it's a political website. It's you know. It, so kind of people blog on there, people write on there. It's b- broadly skewed right, I would argue, although you know other people do write on it. And this was Sir Paul Marshall's one of his first forays, really, into kind of political media. This was before GB News. Absolutely right. Yeah, he set that up, and then he and then he goes off and, and and later kind of becomes one of the major kind of funders of GB News. He'd also, of course, he was funder of a part of the Leave campaign. He was a big Conservative Party funder as well. So he was one of those people that kind of was on the edges of our radar, but. GB News had become much more interesting to us and also uh, kind of it was involved in sort of radical right conferences and things where people were saying quite extreme things or things that we felt were unacceptable. And that's why I guess we started looking at him. I don't think we expected to find what we we ended up finding. Um, The stuff that we've found on, on social media is more extreme than the things we would even probably have concerns about on GB News. But it was definitely that gravitational pull that that media ecosystem of which he is a a really key figure is having on the right of the Conservative Party is also having on things like Reform Party is having an influence on the right of our whole politics at the minute and we should say that some of the things that were liked or retweeted again not tweeted by Sir Paul himself Mm -hmm. he didn't say it but he liked or retweeted people who did they are extreme but some of the things that they say or allude to i.e. the idea that you know muslims are trying to kind of replace indigenous mm. european populations that there is kind of a, a radical islamification of 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 european society lgbtq group, groups having you know undue power all these sorts of things these are very common kind of tropes and ideas and conspiracy theories on parts of certainly the far right of politics and the radical right of politics online in particular Uh, absolutely i mean i think the thing that was shocking here was that a figure that is ostensibly much more influential than most of the far right figures that we would normally mainstream is a a much more mainstream figure and also well resourced and is having this major influence was liking and retweeting content which was very explicitly far right there was kind of this was no um, you know it wasn't ambiguous in terms of what these messages were they were talking about civil war they were talking about invasion uh, they were talking in some cases about expulsion of migrants talking about kind of promoting homophobic content some of the content was kind of lauding Orban for his anti-LGBT policies and also conspiratorial stuff around climate change denial and and some of it was also anti-Ukraine I think the thing that really shocked us is you know hope not hate primarily monitor the traditional far right in, and in its core work as well as the radical right and it was things like retweeting or liking content from britain first or, or, or figures within britain first which is a a very long-standing very extreme traditional far right party you know came out of the british national party um these were figures and individuals and statements that i don't even think they would have allowed on gb news and i think that's important to say is that yes it was just likes and retweets but I think there was a pattern here. This wasn't one message that was liked. It wasn't a slip of a thumb. There was a pattern, especially since the beginning of this year. Well, we should we should just address that because, of course, um, Sir Paul's response, which we've read, um, says that these tweets were just a tiny percentage of his total number of tweets and retweets that he's made since the account. He first had his account. He's now deleted those um, tweets what 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 do you say to that? Is that a fair argument that he's saying that Twitter is a you know it's a fountain of of different views? I think he says or knowledge. Mm. What what do you say to that? I think it's pretty untenable, unfortunately, f- for him. I mean, what we're not talking about is one tweet that we picked up that we thought mm, they, you know he shouldn't have liked or retweeted that. I think from the beginning of this year, he he kind of retweeted or you know or tweeted roughly about 150 odd tweets since January. There was a, you know over 40 of those that we picked up that would absolutely cross our red lines in what we would either call conspiratorial or far-right content. So that's about a quarter, so since the start of the year. Since the start of the year. So this isn't... I mean, I think there is absolutely a pattern of behaviour there. Um, Now, I can't say exactly why he retweeted something. I can't say... We can't know know why and if he agrees with these things. Um, And he says he doesn't. He says he doesn't. There is then still a major question why it is that nearly a quarter of the tweets since the beginning of the year we would we would classify as radical right or far right or, or conspiratorial. Um, that is a pattern of behaviour which I think really does ask questions. And, and even, I suppose we can say, even if we leave that to one side since the start of the year, even if it is a small percentage of, of overall tweets, I mean, the fact that one were to retweet or like even a small percentage of things that were extreme doesn't really excuse the fact that these things are extreme, you could argue. No, absolutely not. And and also s- some of it is, is, as I say, extraordinarily extreme. You know, uh, some of the tweets that have been liked or, or retweeted 
call for like the expulsion of migrants. I think that's up to, to Sir Paul to argue why it was he either liked or retweeted that sort of content uh, if he didn't agree with it. Because, of course, it, whether or not one agrees with it, it certainly amplifies that sort of content if it's liked or retweeted. So to be absolutely clear, should there be questions asked about whether Sir Paul should be allowed to buy the Telegraph if that bid were to be successful? <laughs> yeah, I think there's an absolutely enormous questions. I mean, I think not just us, but many people have raised concerns about the impact of GB News, for example, on our politics. Um, I think the idea that an individual that has this pattern of behaviour on social media could end up with the real, you know, that's this huge British media uh, kind of uh, jewel in some sense, the Telegraph, the Spectator, most extraordinarily influential within on the, the right Conservative politics, Party. Yeah. I think at the very least we need a much better explanation than we've so far received about why someone is retweeting and liking this sort of content. And if that answer doesn't arrive, there has to be questions about whether or not that is a suitable person to be buying that sort of real estate. Do you think that there is an evolution on the right at the moment? I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about the far right here particularly, although they're, they're part of it. I mean in terms of the, the conversation on the right of politics, the mainstream right, you've alluded to GB News and so on, that some of these ideas are becoming more mainstream, that the centre of gravity has moved on the right of British politics. I definitely think that's the case. I think in the last four or so years, four or five years, I think we've seen a radicalisation within the right of the Conservative Party. I think we've seen the emergence of a much stronger radical right ecosystem, not just GB News. I think, you know, even The Telegraph and The Spectator, to be fair, I think are probably publishing things they might not have five years ago. But there's a whole raft of think tanks, uh, social media outlets, etc., that are pumping out content, which I think would have traditionally been confined to much more extreme or far-right places online. And I think now there is a space in British politics on the right of the Conservative Party and that ecosystem around it, which looks much more like the European radical right parties. When we talk about the AFD or the Sweden Democrats or Le Pen, I think there is now a space in Britain that is, I think, would comfortably fit any definition of radical right. And that is especially around the issues of immigration, migration, but also more conspiratorial content as well. Well, I suppose the point is to try and get across to people, right, is the idea that, yes, sometimes tweets like this, you know, for example, the one you referenced about um, the idea that there will be an infiltration. One of the tweets that was, mm -hmm. I think, liked or, or retweeted by Sir Paul, it sort of set out the stages of, of Islamic yeah. infiltration which went all the way from kind of immigration to sort of full-on Islamic theocracy. Yeah. And obviously that's, I mean, a lot of, most people would look at that and think, this, this is mad, you know, this is, a, this is clearly a conspiracy theory. But it's funny how these things can have echoes or can little seeds can be planted. So I noticed today, and I'm not suggesting, for example, that, that he's on the far right or anything like that, but, you know, Nigel Farage linking to the story which is going on in Parliament today. Nigel Farage tweeted just today, by the 2029 general election, we will have a radical Islamic party represented in Westminster, which is kind of an echo of that view, right? Uh, hugely. And I think um, I think a lot of the narratives that we would have traditionally heard back in, say, the English Defence League days, the old, you know, street anti-Muslim street movement uh, from a decade or so ago that talked about invasion, conscious plans for Muslim invasion, the clash of civilizations idea. Um, most, in fact, almost all mainstream people completely rejected groups like the English Defence League. Um, we are definitely increasingly hearing narratives that were traditionally confined beyond the cordon sanitaire, beyond what was acceptable discussions, coming from much more mainstream places. Because of social media, largely? Partly because of social media, partly, I think, because this ecosystem around it has legitimized some of these views. And, you know, I mean, even Suala Braverman in Parliament talking about invasions, I think there was a level of shock a little bit, saying this is something that we would have heard from Tommy Robinson or, or Nick Griffin or these sorts of figures. We're now hearing these things right in the centre of our politics. One final thing, Joe. What would you say to, to this, I suppose, twi a twin critique in a way of, of what you're saying is, is, one, I'm not sure if Sir Paul would say this, but there would be people who are saying and would say, look, um, these are conversations and ideas that have been cut out of the mainstream but they're conversations or ideas that ordinary people, that people out there are having or are thinking that aren't kind of verboten in that way. And that this is what these, I mean, this is often what the sort of radical right or this ecosystem you refer to often say. It's like we're having the conversation that other media outlets aren't having, but real people are. First of all, what would you say to that? I think there is often a tendency to try and frame it as these figures are having the conversations that other people are having in the pub. I think the evidence suggests it's much more likely that people are having conversations in the pub because of what they're hearing these people say. 
people might have all sorts of concerns about various different issues, but the way they are framed by these mainstream figures that have such vast influence, um, the, the words they use, the phrasing they use, the kind of conspiratorial element which they inject, yeah, I mean, you percolates could, through into the pubs. You could have a perfectly legitimate conversation about whether we need to reduce immigration and not believe that immigration is some kind of massive conspiracy to literally install an Islamic theocratic regime. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> People are having conversations about immigration levels, etc. As you say, the difference is when someone says there is a conscious plan or we're being invaded by people using phrases like of oh, fighting age. That phrasing that is traditionally from the far right, which is now emanating out of the mainstream, percolates through and affects, so I would say infects, the wider discussions that are happening around society. And that's why it's so irresponsible. And secondly, what would you say to the argument is also put, which is to say, fine, you're talking about a radicalisation of the discourse on the right. What about a radicalisation of discourse on the left? You know, the radical right will say that so-called identity politics, woke agenda, whatever you want to call it, is also a kind of type of radicalisation and that needs to be accounted for. I'd like to see... I'd like to see the evidence for a, for a point like that. I mean, I, I think when people talk about or attempt to falsely equate, this is something, of course, Donald Trump famously did. There was people, go, you know, good people on both sides, he argued, after the Charlottesville rally. Um, I think it's a false equivalence. People that are calling for more equality, for, uh, you know, less hate crime, for people that are saying we should be less racist, less misogynist, less homophobic, to equate those with people that are spreading misinformation and conspiracy theories about Muslim immigration, uh, I think... One is overtly and clearly and provably harmful on society. Uh, the other one has, broadly speaking, had a more positive thing. That's not to say that people on the left haven't made mistakes or don't do things wrong and that everyone is perfect, but it is a false equivalency when we look at um, uh, the impact of right-wing and far-right politics versus people that are ostensibly, robustly calling for less misogyny, homophobia and, and, and racism. Um, it's a nice try, but I just don't think the evidence is there for it. And I think that point that you made is really important, Lewis, because, yes, of course, you can have extremists on the right and the left. I guess the main difference is that the right tends to be much better funded. And I think money is important in this story because we are talking about financial influence. A man who is co-funding GB News, a man who we understand is worth hundreds of millions of pounds, a man who has already donated half a million pounds to the Conservative Party. And there are senior Conservatives who have praised him, who have looked at, for example, Michael Gove has praised his model philanthropy because he is a man who's also using a lot of his money for, for philanthropy. He's founded ARC, ARC Schools, 40 academies with the aim of closing the attainment gap. So clearly he's a man who has money to spend on the causes in which he believes. Fantastic if it's going towards schools, fantastic if it's going towards education, although I wonder what you'd think if you were a Muslim family or a gay family, knowing that this was where uh, the funding was coming from. But I think it's also relevant that somebody who has hundreds of millions of pounds is now involved so closely to what is, I think we can start to say, becoming mainstream. GB News is not fringe. You know, the views on Unheard are not fringe. The Telegraph is certainly right in the middle of mainstream conservative thought. And I think that does present a problem for those now who have closely associated themselves with him and indeed knighted him. He is Sir Paul Marshall. Look, there is a important point to make here that since he anonymised his account, there is a much higher percentage of those sort of tweets that have come out than before he anonymised it. There isn't a similar corollary. He can't just say, oh, well, I've, I've supported as many left-wing causes as I have, right? No, it's, the, it's extremist nature of so many of the tweets that have been liked and retweeted. And that, of course, begs the question, is he a fit and proper person to buy the Telegraph and to buy the Spectator and to become one of the most significant media owners in Britain? There's a whole argument going on about whether the UAE should be able to buy the Telegraph. And there are arguments against that for national security reasons and people saying that you couldn't have the, one of the crown jewels of the British media empire going to a foreign owner. Well, does the question now get raised? Is Sir Paul Marshall a fit and proper person, given those extremist views that he has amplified, to be the owner of the Telegraph, the Spectator, as well as already owning Unheard and GB News. And I guess to go back to his statement, right, he is saying just because I tweeted them doesn't mean that I endorse them, just because I like them doesn't mean I 
like them. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to guess reconcile his position with the fact that they're now deleted. Because when he deleted them, he said, well, essentially, I just didn't, you know, I didn't want them to get more traction than they have. Well, you indeed, know. the question but, is, why delete them? Well, or why amplify them? If you don't yeah. want them to get traction, why do that in the first exactly. place? Exactly. Either don't amplify them in the first place, or if you're just Happy sharing views... Free press. Why delete them? Yeah. Look, I think John's right that there are... I mean, we've gone to the government to ask the, them this. There are now questions for the Department for Culture, for the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser about what she thinks about this um, uh, and what, about whether Marshall it should be the sort of person, if whether he holds these views or not, for the fact that he's amplified them, whether he's appropriate person to buy the Telegraph. The wider question is simply one about there's this concept, right, in politics we've all become very familiar with over the last few years, which is the Overton, Overton window. window. Right? Come on, which everyone, is, join in the chorus. Uh, the Overton window. I can see it from here. See it from the train. I once passed Overton Station somewhere, <laughs> and I just took a little picture of it just to amuse myself and no one else, but <laughs> through the window of the train. But, you know, it's the Overton window, which is the idea of basically what are the acceptable parameters of politics? Like, what are thought? I mean, it's, it sounds grim, but it's not. What are thoughts that are just beyond the pale or what are accepted and what's not? And I think in all sorts of ways, we all know that the Overton window on all sorts of issues has expanded or has moved in lots of ways over the past 10 years. And that is actually why these extremist accounts, even though they might be extremist and they might be obscure sometimes, and many of them aren't obscure anymore, but it's why they matter, because they often plant seeds which gradually get percolated around. And the fact that someone like Paul Marshall, who is in many ways in the mainstream of kind of conservative politics, the fact that he was retweeting and liking this stuff, I think speaks to the fact that that Overton window has moved and it has moved on the right of politics in a very radical direction. I mean, if you just take the language on immigration over the last 20 years, when Tory leaders in the past you'd use words like flooded or swamped, you know, they were absolutely castigated. Now you've got Suella Braverman, former Home Secretary, using invaded, right? So just in that one verb, we have already moved to a place that it's, is much closer to some of those tweets that Paul Marshall is liking or retweeting. I think it's important on this occasion that the House is able to consider the widest possible range of options. I have therefore decided to select the amendments both in the name of the Prime Minister and in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. If you want to, do it! We're completely appear to be doing things in a way that's never been done before. Can I ask for your advice, Mr Speaker, what is the point of an opposition day if it's going to be done like this? The government does not have confidence that it will be able to vote on its own motion. For that reason, the government will play no further part in the decision this House takes on today's proceedings. Can you please advise me where on earth is the Speaker of the House of Commons? How do we bring him to that seat? The SNP and some Conservative MPs exiting the chamber pretty much in protest against Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker. Today has not shown the House at its best. I will reflect on my... I will reflect on my part in that of the course I recommit myself to ensuring that all members of this House are treated fairly. I will take significant convincing that your position is not now intolerable. To respond to that, and quite rightly, I understand the feeling. I think it is fair to say it was not the House of Commons finest hour last night. It was chaotic. It was rancorous. It was bitter. It was seething. It was incomprehensible, I should imagine, to anyone who was watching as sort of parliamentary procedure kind of went up in flames, uh, apparently over Gaza. And yet it all seemed to be about party political interest and the Commons order paper. Uh, Today, though, you are left in a position where there is collateral damage and the Speaker looking much weaker than he was. And I think a lot of people have got a lot of respect for Sir Lindsay Hoyle. I think he's seen as fair, impartial, that he doesn't weigh in on one side. But it has left people asking, why on earth did you make the decisions you made yesterday 
on the SNP's opposition day when it wasn't just their motion that got voted on, it was Labour's as well. Well, Stephen Flynn was furious last night. This is him this lunchtime. My colleagues and I were denied the ability to vote on a matter which is of grave concern to us and which over recent months we have sought to raise in this chamber at every available yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It ultimately turned in to a Labour opposition day. Yep. That, quite frankly, is not acceptable. And as I have expressed to you privately prior to proceedings here today, we do, there, we do not, on these benches, therefore believe that you can continue in your role as Speaker. We do not have confidence in your ability to do so. So I would therefore welcome clarity, either from yourself or indeed from the Leader of the House, as to how we can best facilitate a vote in this chamber at the earliest possible occasion to that effect. And indeed, on this question of MP safety, which is, as I say, something I think that the Speaker does take very seriously, because ultimately he is the kind of custodian or representative of all MPs. It is something that he talked about when he addressed the Commons this afternoon. I will also come in at this point. I will reiterate, I made a judgment call that didn't end up in the position where I expected it to. I regret it. I apologise to the SNP. Just, just bear with me for me. I apologise and I apologise to the House. I made a mistake. We do make mistakes. I am up to mine. I would say that we can have an SO24 to get an immediate debate because the debate is so important to this House. I will defend every member in this House. Every member matters to me in this House. And it has been said, both sides, I never ever want to go through a situation where I pick up a phone to find a friend of whatever side has been murdered by terrorists. I also don't want another attack on this house. I was in the chair on that day. I have seen, I have witnessed, I won't share the details but the details of the things that have been brought to me are absolutely frightening on all members of this House, on all sides. I have a duty of care, and I say that. And if my mistake is looking after members, I am guilty. I am guilty because... Oh, have some grace. Have some grace. I have a duty of care that I will carry out to protect people. It is the protection that led me to make a wrong decision. But what I do not apologise is the risk that's being put on all members at the moment. I had serious meetings yesterday with the police on the issues and threats to politicians, threats heading to an election. And I do not want anything to happen again. So yes, I will apologise. I always will when I make a mistake. I did. I offer an SO24. That is within my gift and power. But I will also say I will do whatever it is to protect anybody in this chamber or anybody who works in this house. That is my duty of care. Yeah. Try and answer why it is that the speaker's in trouble. I mean, we don't want to get into all of the sort of parliamentary kind of uh, minutiae of it because you'll all just switch off. But essentially what happened was the speaker went against precedent. The SNP was supposed to basically control the agenda of the House of Commons, which they don't get to do very often yesterday. They put forward a specific motion calling for basically an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. That would have put... Keir Starmer's Labour in a difficult position because he would have probably faced several resignations from his front bench, just like he did last November. So Starmer went to the Speaker, apparently, or Labour asked the Speaker to, in an unusual way, accept their own motion, which still basically called for a ceasefire, but it was a little bit more qualified than the SNP's one. 
The Speaker decided to do that, which went against precedent. And this has got the Conservative Party and the SNP completely up in arms to the extent that last night they just both walked out of the Commons Chamber and the Labour motion went through without a division, without a vote. There is lots of unhappiness on both the SNP benches and the Conservative benches attacking the Speaker, who, I have to say, looked absolutely mortified yesterday and came back to the Commons to apologise, essentially. I mean, it's very rare in public political life that you see somebody apologise for their actions. And I think it's worth going into what we now understand the motivation to be, because there was a time in the frenzy of last night when it all looked as if every party was just politicking off its own sort of virtue signalling position. And there was Labour accusing the SNP of trying to create division and sort of sow chaos in their party by going one step further in their amendment than Labour had and bringing it. And then there was unrest that the Conservatives were trying to stall on their motion and indeed that they then walked out completely. And the reason that the Speaker gave for allowing each party their own motion, I think is an important one. He said it was vital that every MP got to vote according to their own sense of where this ceasefire motion should be. And that was because it is so emotive that they were facing sometimes physical, often digital threats to their safety from their constituents. And so I think this has now opened up a much bigger question as to MP safety, MP's relationship to their own voters, and whether parliamentary process or protocol still works in the same way if we are now imagining a world in which MPs are getting physically threatened or, or barred from getting into their own homes, as Tobias Elwood was last week, because the force of passion over Gaza, over Israel, is so strong now that there isn't any room for... A, a, I guess, a sort of di diplomacy involved or nuance of argument. Well, the, the reason why... I mean, the suggestion yesterday and the reason this was causing such fury on the SNP benches and the Tory benches, the accusation had been that basically Starmer and Hoyle had worked together, had conspired to try and basically give Starmer a way out because it meant having a Labour motion that Starmer would not have resignations and so on, he could keep his party together. I think that was always far-fetched. I don't think Hoyle would have done that. What is coming forth today and what is becoming clear is actually the critique of the Speaker, which many Conservatives feel is just as powerful, is that because Hoyle was so concerned that he wanted to give Labour MPs a way of voting for a motion that they could vote for without deciding, basically, do I have to decide between my own personal safety in voting for a ceasefire or my whip, my job on the front bench? In having to make that decision, Hoyle was trying to give them a way out of that dilemma. The Tories are saying that that is itself a bad idea because what you were doing, Mr Speaker, is basically giving in to the threat of physical intimidation, which changes the nature of our parliamentary discourse. So that is the conversation that is going on today. And why it is that at the time of recording, nearly 60 MPs, SNP and Conservative, are calling for, via a motion in the House of Commons, are calling for the Speaker to resign. And the way it is going to be phrased on the far right, taking this back to where we started this podcast, is that radical extremists, inverted commas, uh, you know, supporting Gaza, supporting the Palestinian cause, are upending the way Parliament does its business. And that isn't good enough. And that shouldn't be allowed to happen. And our own parliamentary democracy is being distorted by the threat from the extremes. Yeah. And that will be seized upon by the far right. But again, you know, where are the radical extremists in Israel? They're right inside the cabinet. They're right inside the government. They're working alongside Netanyahu. And I think the problem with this, and it's worth going back to our interview with Stephen Flynn, the SNP leader in Westminster, where we put to him all these questions about why the SNP wanted to bring this amendment in the first place. And, and you can hear that on Tuesday's episode. But I think... The, the question we asked was, why can't you find a form of words? If, if what matters ultimately are the people of Gaza, are the kids that are getting killed, are the hostages that need to be released, why can't you all, as a parliament, find the form of words? Because everyone's 
pretty much in the they same place. They don't even place. disagree that much. They don't yeah. really disagree. That's what's pathetic about exactly. it. Exactly. Yes. But I think that this is, is the, the point. That is the pathetic partisanship. It, but within that, there are people, I guess, who want to lean more into what happened on October the 7th and the flare-up of anti-Semitism. And there are people who want to lean more into what they call collective punishment, which is where the SNP are. And there are people who are trying to find... I mean, you know, I put it crudely in a sort of a Nando's menu, which is you've got your hot, your medium and your lemon and herb. Everyone is broadly on the side of Nando's chicken, but they're all finding their own sort of place that they feel able to sign up to that wording. And I think... They cannot reach that consensus at the moment because it's so emotive. It's but, so emotive. But I'm sorry, but like the thing is, is that there's so much accusations of, I mean, and, and Penny Morden has been saying it in the Commons today. In fact, let's listen to that. Penny Morden has been attacking Keir Starmer in the Commons today for politicising the issue. I want to say that this House will never bow to extremists, threats or intimidation. It has not. It will not. It must not. And I would ask all honourable members not to do this House a further disservice by suggesting that the shameful events that took place yesterday were anything other than party politics on behalf of the I mean, clearly, we all want to agree with that statement that nobody should be bowing to political pressure or threats from their own constituents. But imagine if something had happened last night. You know, imagine if there had been another David Amos, another Joe Cox. Well, imagine yeah. if somebody had actually been killed or, you know, their kids had been attacked or they hadn't been able um, to, you know, to, to get into their home. There'd been an arson attack, you know, the Mike Freer situation. Imagine what we'd be saying this morning. Was it really worth stopping MPs from voting in the way that they felt they could exactly. for that? And also, I'm sorry, there is loads of party politics to go around here. I mean, on all sides, on yeah. all sides, right? Yeah. Now, I don't doubt for one moment that MPs on every side of the house they want to express their view on Gaza, and in their own way, and there isn't that far as we say to, at that much space between them, they want to express that. But let's not pretend, ultimately, that this wasn't also about party politics. The SNP put the motion down partly because they knew it would embarrass the Labour Party and create divisions for the Labour Party. Keir Starmer wanted to try and sit in the space that he has done forever, which is, to some extent at least, looking both ways. He didn't want to just accept the SNP motion. The Conservatives put their own motion down precisely because they knew it would trigger a, a, a series of parliamentary mechanisms that would embarrass the Labour Party. Every single party has got an awareness and an eye on their own party political interest with this issue, partly because, of course, the stakes are incredibly low. Yeah. This is not a motion that will affect any actual change in Gaza. And the stakes are incredibly high because it's a general election and, year. And general Le election yeah. and stakes are high for their personal safety. And I hear the argument yeah. that we shouldn't give in to, personal, to intimidation and so on. But I actually do think that the Speaker is very, very aware of his responsibility with this. And I actually take what he said at face value, which yeah. is he wanted to give the widest possible array of options for MPs to express their view in their own yeah. particular let, way. Let me be the motherhood and apple pie candidate in all of this. That I think that if the three parties had wanted to show concern over Gaza and Israel and what should happen next, they could have found a form of words that wouldn't have got everything that everyone wanted, but would have probably totally. got enough consensus but that's not what they wanted last night and that's night. not where adversarial sits in and that's not adversarial where adversarial politics, politics, sits, politics sits and you had a speaker who tried to position himself in the middle of the road and, and as the old up. metaphor goes if you sit in the middle of the road you end up as roadkill yeah. and that is where sir lindsay hoyle finds himself now with a question mark as we record this at midday of whether he survives or not conservative mps who are moving against him ought to be quite careful in the sense that if they get rid of him that itself will set a very dangerous precedent, which is okay. that suddenly the government of the day can get rid of a speaker just because he or she does something that they don't like. And guess what? There's probably another government coming down the tracks quite soon who might decide to alight upon that precedent themselves. There was a moment in the Commons where Keir Starmer left and he just muttered a thank you to Lindsay Hoyle. Now, that was probably just, you know, civic s sort of gratitude but on one level, if you were on the Tory benches and you were watching that and you thought the Labour leader's in cahoots with the Speaker, it's not a great look for either of them. We'll be back in just a moment. So if you want to know more about the Paul Marshall story, we have put out a video explainer which will be going across 
all news agents, social channels. And as John said earlier, I'm sure we will be returning to the story as well in the next few weeks. We're off. The well, news actually, agents will be back tomorrow. We will. We're going to do a special Q&A this week answering your questions. We've got some really good questions from A-level students, politics students. We are doing your homework for you right now. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Again? Yes. Just finish that. And yes. we will. that will be dropping over the weekend. And tomorrow we will have be back with your friend, your bathtub friend, yeah. John, Joe Lysett. Fabulous. We're not doing it in a bath, unlike you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 